All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly online event. We are um, a webinar, some people call us, a webcast, an online show. Um, call us what you will. Uh, we are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record all of our shows every week, and you can see them on our website, watch all of our previous recordings, see all the previous presentations. Um, I'll show you where that is at the end of today's show. Um, we do a mixture of things here on Encompass Live, um, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos um, of, of products and services. Basically, uh, anything library related, we um, are happy to have on the show. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do commission-centric type sessions, but we also bring in guest speakers. Um, and this morning, that's what we have. On the line with us is Dave Mixdorf. Hi, Dave. Hello. Hello. And Dave is a director at our um, South Sioux City, Nebraska Public Library, um, way up in northeast Nebraska, north of us by a few hours. <laughs> um, and they do a lot of great programming there at South Sioux City. Um, Dave's been on the show a few times before talking about the various things that they've got going on there. Um, and this is a new one that I had not heard about before. Um, and Dave had uh, mentioned it. So um, we're going to have him talk about their program they've got going on with them. Um, well, as the title says, Feeding the Hungry, getting some uh, information about that out to people in your community. So I'll just um, pass it on to you, Dave, to go ahead and take it away. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm sure Krista was kind of sweating there. This is one of those mornings. Um, I didn't even realize it was 10 o'clock until she called on the phone. <laughs> and we got three new staff that started today. Also, oh, wow. just randomly, I read an email that normally I would never read, and it's like they were having a meeting tonight at the library, and I'm like, uh, we don't know anything about it, and it was a big group meeting, and all the <laughs> meeting room spaces were, you know, already taken, uh -huh. so we were scrambling trying to figure out what to do with those people, so. so a, a typical day at the library. Right now, you would, thank God there's no camera showing my desk. <laughs> it's a typical so day at the library. One of those stressful mornings already. <laughs> but, um, what I'm going to talk about is a program that we got started called Feeding the Hungry at the Library, and it's kind of a concept that um, grew out of that thinking that we're not just books anymore. And so this is something that we've done quite a bit of unique programs at our library for the fact that due to our population, we have a lot of low-income individuals in our community. So we look at ourselves as one First, being a community center, because there's not really a art museum, science museum, um, there's no movie theaters, there's none of that kind of stuff in our community. They have to go to Sioux City, which is not far away, but once again, if you don't have transportation, it just still makes it difficult. So we do a lot of those types of things. And this kind of program grew out of that concept of the community center, working with social service agencies and a variety of other places. Um, there we go. Um, program, I'll give you a little background. Our little library, we do about 1,200 programs now a year at the library. Last year we were up to about 1,400, and then we had a children's physician or staff member that left, so that dropped out all our evening time kids programs. And every night we do a kids program here, so that drops your numbers pretty quick. We do a lot of technology programs, and we're in the process of redoing those two right now. We're trying to get to the point where more of our tech programs are more the new things that are popping up out there. So we've been looking at a lot of the unique things, and we want to look at the potential for the makerspace type area. I don't know where we would put it here. But that's something that we're kind of looking at now for the future, too. Um, we do that many programs with just four full-time staff and six part-time staff. And for our staff, every person does some sort of program here. And um, they, we allow them work time to actually research out their programs and information like that. Um, some of the 
kind of unique things that we do. Um, we have a library eats, we have a tangled yarns, we have a crafts group, and the staff actually gets time during the day to research those types of things out. Also for our tech ones, uh, we're trying to get it so all our staff will actually teach technology classes. So once the three new people get into the routine, one hour at least a week, um, each staff person will have a designated time where they'll take a laptop back somewhere and just try to learn a specific type of program that we aren't doing right now. We use volunteers also for a lot of our programs. Uh, we have service organizations that come in and help. We have a variety of other different things or groups that come in and do like one type thing, that type of stuff. And then we use a lot of agencies in the town. Um, if we actually kept track of the agencies that we kind of set up the programs for, and we provide the space. And if we actually counted all those, like we have the public health department that comes here, uses one of our meeting rooms, we schedule the appointments literally for them. And they serve us four to five people every, every, well, twice a week. So that's about 10 people right there. And that's 52 weeks a year that we have just that one group come in and use it. And then we have other groups that come in that put on programs, use our space, use our materials, and things like that. And so, but we don't even count those in any of our numbers because. It's really none of our staff at all participating or doing the program. Um, the Speed in the Program Hungry kind of came out of our strategic plan. For those out there that have had the opportunity to write a strategic plan, um, it's an interesting concept because when we first started it, um, the board and I, we kind of came up with a whole bunch of ideas. We thought, oh, these are fantastic. Turned them in for the first evaluation. I kind of got back and said, these are all very nice for the library. What can you do for the community? And we were like, oh, we thought this is working with the community. But what we had to do is look more outside of our actual, actual doors. So that was a big thing that we were kind of looking at. So we were trying to figure out how to find information on what the community actually needed. So we did a couple town hall meetings. And we had very simple questions. We did it in English, and then we had town hall meetings in Spanish. And we had five basic questions. You know, what do you like about the community? What things you do not like about the community? And, you know, those simple basic questions. And out of that, we got some other ideas that came out. And it didn't matter if they were talking about potholes, because we turned that information over then to the streets department. We did our in-house library surveys, and those were a little more in-depth. Um, I think our surveys that we did in-house were probably five pages long, and those were patrons that were really using the library on a real reliable basis that we felt they probably know exactly what's going on here. And we were surprised how many comments people said, well, we'd like you to see me start this, 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 and we were already doing that. So how were we not reaching those individuals with the information? And I mean, we have posters up, we have postcards, not any kind of ideas on Facebook. We do all that typical stuff, but somehow we still weren't reaching people. Um, the school is the big challenge for us to kind of get their viewpoints on what to do here in our community. Um, so we actually had a board member who was a former teacher and new superintendent. Well enough, I don't know if she had him as a student or what, but um, she went into the schools and handed out surveys to literally all the teachers in the school district. And it was very interesting because it opened up our eyes realizing most of our teachers don't live in our school district. They live in Sioux City. And most of them didn't have library cards. Most of them didn't even know any of the kind of programs that we were doing there once again. So that was an option that we had to look at. How can we get them more to what's going on here? And then we took surveys out to area businesses. We figured we're, these were smaller ones, I think like a two-page survey. 
and they could drop them off right back to the business, like the high meat grocery store. Um, we couldn't get them in Walmart, but other different places we had them scattered around town. And we had both English and Spanish. And so we were able to get responses back that way. And I was actually kind of surprised how many came back. They dropped them off at the library at City Hall and at the area businesses. So we kind of learned about the people that we don't necessarily see coming in the door all the time. Then we also met with a lot of area service organizations that are out there. Uh, you'll notice we're not very creative with names on our groups. Uh, Dakota County Connection is a group that's looking at how to improve the life of the kids in the community. And the big one that our group, that group is working on right now, I'm a part of that group, is a literally a real community center that incorporates the boys club, the girls club out of Sioux City to come over and do programming. The Y would actually come in and do programs for the kids. The library would set up a mini library at this location. Um, there would be after school programs, before school programs, summer school programs uh, using uh, the Nebraska Department of Wildlife to come in and do programs, Dakota County Extension come in, um, the health department. We're looking at kind of a well rounded place where we could have social service agencies also have offices located in the same building and possibly a daycare center located in this building. And then also we worked with the Mary J. Terrilligan Community House, which does a lot of immigration issues and things like that. They're very much interested in doing more in the South Sioux City. Um, they're located in um, Sioux City. And of all these groups, Dakota County Connections is the only one that's kind of really located in South Sioux. Everybody else is in another town. Uh, poverty and hunger issues were one of the big things that kind of popped out with meeting with different groups, with people talking about, um, like at our um, town hall meetings where they made mention that there was no way to get to the grocery store. You know, if they weren't on a bus route, you know, how did they get to the grocery store? Um, we have an abundance of Hispanic grocery stores in the community, but they're located kind of in specific areas. We have Hy-Vee that sits, as a typical community now, sits out on the edge of town, out kind of in the shopping center strip. And so if you don't have a, a car to get to these places, it's very difficult. Um, some of the things that we found out in some of our surveys and then doing research, um, Nebraska has a lot of people that are what they call food insecure. Um, they don't know where their next meal is coming from a lot of the times. Dakota County was 11.5%. So approximately out of 14,000 people in this community, 2,410 people don't know where their meal is coming from each and every day. And then Dakota County ranked 78 out of 79 counties in the health behaviors and social economic factors that's out there. Um, Health-wise, we have a lot of overweight people, a lot of people that eat, um, I guess you could call it ethnic type foods that probably are not the most healthy type of foods for you. And so um, we were always struggling trying to figure out what we could kind of do to help with that. So out of that, um, some of the ideas that we have been doing in the past without really knowing how bad the hunger issue was, is we helped start the first community garden here in South Sioux. Uh, this picture is a garden that's no longer there. Somebody bought the house that the land was sitting on. The family that lived there had been library users for a long time. They said, yeah, you can use our site yard. And so that was one of the very first spots. And then we have now a spot behind an old school that now has just been recently purchased. So we're trying to work it out with the community garden space stays there um, for a time. And that has about 24 garden spots at that point. This one had only about eight spots. And a school group 
that we were working with actually was one of the first groups that put in a garden spot there. And we did a working process on how to plant seeds, how to raise your own food and fix your own food. And now we have one more community garden spot that's located out of the area church that's a large one that there could be 40 different families using there. But the community garden was kind of that first shot that we did in the community for food. Then the next option became the community orchard. Uh, it's now two years old. This picture was taken quite a while ago. You can see in the background um, a fence running along that tree line. Well, now we have a fence completely enclosing the whole orchard so the deer stay out of it. We're in the process of putting in other fruits, uh, strawberries, raspberries, uh, honeyberries, just a wide mixture of fruits back in there. And there will be a couple um, what we call perennial gardens that will have things like rhubarb and horseradish and things that come back each and every year. So what we're looking at on the community orchard is down the road, uh, we figure in about five years time period this will be producing fruit and people will be able to come in and harvest fruit and be able to take home and eat. And then we'll have volunteers that will come in and help harvest food or fruit and then take it to our food distribution spots. So, and this was totally done by a grant and the city pretty much gave up that piece of land which had been sitting there for a long time. And so all the trees and everything else that's in there has all been paid by grant money. Well, with the combination of all these little things, um, once we got talking about some of those food issues, we contacted a variety of people that we knew in the community, and we kind of created this group called Voices for Food. There's a kind of a national organization that does this concept that's out there. So we created our own Dakota County Voices for Food, once again, not getting creative with the name. And of the individuals that are there, there are business owners. Um, there's an individual that works for Tyson Meats. Um, there's Dakota County Extension individuals I see in there. There's County Health Department. There is a lawyer that works with immigration in the, or issues. Um, Hy-Vee, delicate, or not dietitian, the dietitian, Hy-Vee dietitian is in here. Plus, there's other inter interested individuals in the community. And then one of our area businesses actually donated land for us to be able to use. And we created our own Voices for Food Facebook page. And I'm going to kind of click on this quick so you can see what it is. Hopefully, it will work. Yep. I'll be logging quick. Hopefully it will go right to it. Yep, it did. So we created our own Facebook page because this was, once again, as many librarians run into, you have great ideas, but how do you get that information out there to people? And so this is a picture of the chamber doing the ribbon cutting at the actual community garden space that we created. And each week they post new information, recipes, the big thing that we look at is how to teach people to eat healthier, um, how to grow certain things. Um, so there's a lot of different things that come out of uh, the Voices for Food type program. I have to go back to, I'm going to close this out. Hopefully I won't kill off my program. Um, go back to my PowerPoint. There we go. So we created a Facebook page. And it's actually turned into be a very good way to get information out there. Um, we do promotional things. We send out flyers um, to home gardeners. Do you have garden extra produce? Do you want to be able to help people? We have basic information that we send out to individuals to see if they'd be willing to grow an extra row. And then this is a shot of our Voices for Food garden plot. This is located behind one of the businesses in town. Um, it pretty much was just a yard sitting on the back 
and the city came in with a rototiller, filled the whole thing up for us for free. They've got a grant now to fence the whole area and put in irrigation lines. And so this was kind of a group effort of a variety of people to go in and plant the garden and then take care of it, weed it, do all those basic kind of things that you do for growing food. At the library, our contribution is part of the strategic plan. One, we do cooking classes on what you can actually grow out in the garden space. And the thing that kind of surprised me, especially in our community, is how many people didn't know how to fix basic, what, what I call Nebraska or Midwest type vegetables. Um, they do other types of things. Um, this was one of our first ones, which was an interesting class because it was a Chinese cooking class taught by two gals from Japan, and then we had a gal from Mexico that also taught it. So talk about a cultural mix of uh, materials there. Um, but these are two volunteers, and then we had one staff member that participated, and then that's Kim in the background who's another staff member. She's the one that's kind of taken charge of our library eats, which is a basic food education type program for individuals out there. Um, each month, a new recipe, some sort of specialized thing. Uh, last year, like they did, for example, squash. All the way to the point of how do you get inside a winter squash to be able to fix? What can you do with squash? And the thing that they look at is how to do things economically. You know, what you can get out of the garden that you aren't spending a lot of money on coming in and, you know, fixing these fancy Martha Stewart type meals. Um, we've started canning classes. Um, our library actually went out and bought some canner equipment, and so now you can actually check out your own canning supplies at the library. The only thing you have to provide is your own jars and lids, but everything else is available at the library. We do canning classes. Uh, this next year we're actually taking canning classes out on the road where we'll be going to area churches and when we have an excess of tomatoes that have been donated we will teach the individuals how to can their own tomato sauce and then they'll take home the items and with the basic knowledge of now they know how to possibly can. This was at Jams and Jellies uh, workshop that we did and how to create something like that. Um, we do garden classes quite often. In probably about two weeks, we do one on seed starting. Um, we meet once a month. We've done a wide variety of topics. Um, the square foot gardening is one that we kind of recommend for our beginning gardeners that want to grow a lot of food in small spaces for the donated. Um, but you just see the mixture of different things that we do there. So that kind of ties into this too. For years, we were trying to figure out how to help our kids in the community, especially the ones that came to the library. We are a very typical um, community where we have kids come in after school at 3, 3.15, and they are here till 7 o'clock, or 7.30, or 8 o'clock. And these kids run all the way from kindergartners up to high school students. High school students are looking after their younger brothers and sisters because there's nobody at home. They're all working. And we wanted to try and give food, you know, provide meals here at the library when we didn't have a certified kitchen. Um, then we looked at trying to do snack type things. But the cost was so prohibitive, even though we were getting Ivy was willing to sell us almost at cost the snacks. We'd have to try and find a group that would help donate money. So kind of through a lot of talking over the years on how to do this, one of the area churches that's located about a block, block and a half away, decided to start up a kids cafe. And this church on every Monday and Friday evening does meals at their cat kitchen in their, their church, totally free to everybody, and they serve between 60 to 80 meals each and every time. 
And we now work with this group, Kids Cafe, that once a month, after they're done eating their meal on a Friday night, I will stay late at the library after it's closed and we'll do a movie time at the library so the kids will get to have a little opportunity. This has become so popular that we've been trying to figure how to expand it into other areas. Uh, we have families that have been walking eight to 12 blocks in the winter time to come to the kids' cafe and get a hot meal. Uh, it's now expanded that each Monday and Friday when the kids leave, they take a backpack home with them that has food that they can then, you know, can foods from the food pantry, things like that. So this has become very popular now and something we'd really like to see expanded. Um, and this all kind of came out of these discussions on how we can feed the hungry in our community. Um, this is another thing that popped up. You know, once you get the food or the vegetables donated, what can you do with them? So we got a group of churches and other organizations that agreed to become pickup sites and processing sites. And so gardeners can bring in a five-gallon bucket of tomatoes, a five-gallon bucket of green beans, drop them off at one of these locations, and each one has different times during the week, and volunteers will actually come in and clean the produce, prepare it, and put it in kind of serving sizes so that individuals then can come in on the pickup days and pick them up. So there's actually processing days and pickup days that people can come in and get stuff. And so and these churches are all located kind of in different locations in the city, plus and also Dakota City, which is just south of us, has a location for it. Uh, so that's really worked out pretty nice. We have volunteer groups, and we take anybody and everybody. Um, this is a group of adult special needs students that are right at that transition stage. Uh, they're too old for being in high school now, but they're in that 18 to 21 year range. And so they go out to Goodwill Camp and do projects out there and they help in the community garden. And they're very good at picking. Uh, in fact, this is a unique picture because the tall gentleman in the center is holding a sweet potato, where if you actually look at it, it looks kind of like a aquatic fruit. And so they thought that was very unique and brought it in. And the newspaper came and took a picture of it. And um, the person standing, you can see me in the background with my red checkered shirt, the person in the blue shirt standing next to me, blue and green, she's one of the business owners that donated the land. And then this group has come in and helped pick tomatoes, help dig, you know, do a variety of things like that. They help dig the potatoes, some of the sweet potatoes. We have high school groups that will come in and plant during the year or weed volunteers. I go in probably once every two, three weeks when I get a chance. And since I know the difference between weeds and vegetables, I don't have to have anybody there. So I just go out there with a plastic garbage bag and crawl up to the garden pulling weeds. So for me, that's relaxing. That, if today was an example, I'd be out there weeding for a couple hours after today. Because that's to be a stress relief. Um, this year was the very first year for that garden. And that garden alone, collected and distributed over 9,000 pounds of produce just this first summer. That was without any of the other groups that brought in food. Um, I think the total that was donated was very close to 15,000 pounds of produce came in from volunteers, things like that. This was the very first year that we did it. Uh, we're still working at looking at uh, contacting more area farmers as we get the information out more and more. Um, we did have a farmer that had planted sweet corn and said he could come in and pick sweet corn, so that was distributed out. Um, so there's a wide variety of education that we're still looking at doing. I'm looking at our time, and I'm getting close to the end of my presentation here, so I can take questions if need be. Future plans that we're looking at right now, 
is continued expansion of the education programs for growers. Um, the big thing that we find is we get a lot of tomatoes donated and we get a lot of squash donated. We don't get a lot of like beans. We don't get a lot of peas. We don't get a lot of those other kind of vegetables. And so what we're finding is a lot of the growers don't know that you can grow continuous crops of green beans or dry beans. Dry beans is a very good um, crop to grow for the fact that it's extremely nutritious, takes up very little amount of space, and for what you grow in that little amount of space, you get a lot of product. So one thing that we're looking at trying to expand this next year is grower education programs where we're specifically talking about if you put in like a 20-foot row, 5 feet wide extra in your garden, and plant these three products right here. You can harvest this at a certain time, and now you can plant something else in that same spot and harvest something else. And then after that's done, you can plant this. And in the late fall, early winter, we could be bringing in cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, different things like that. Um, so that's a big, big thing that we really notice that we have to do is educate some of our growers that are out there that are participating in. So it's not just one crop and you're done that situation. Recruiting new growers. Um, this is the biggest thing probably we really look at right now is how to get more people to participate and be able to donate. We've got volunteers plenty for working in those kitchens. We've got plenty of hungry people. Um, they gave me a number one time, and it was almost 1,500 some people that have come to the food pantries, that have come to the cafe, kids cafe, to get free produce or free meals in our community. So we're getting a lot of people out there. It's just we need the grower to expand. And then library is a food distribution site that stays open past 5 p.m. Um, that was one of the big discussions that came up at our last meeting was that all our food pantry locations here close at 5. And we have a lot of people that work till 5. And then they have no place to be able to go. And so we actually started doing a discussion, well, what area of businesses could do something like this? And I was sitting there going, well, the library is open till 8. And so then the discussion got into it, okay, well, what could we take there, and I kind of described what our situation was, and we kind of discussed that if we got dry goods, canned goods, box goods, you know, that are the typical stuff that come from the food pantries, that we could put that into cardboard boxes. We have lots of Baker and Taylor cardboard boxes that we could fill up with dry goods. Um, we can't handle fresh produce. We can't handle anything frozen because we just don't have that kind of facility here. But any kind of dry goods people could actually come to the library and be able to pick it up up to 8 p.m. And everybody sat there and kind of looked at each other and, well, we never had kind of thought of that before. So that was a very good idea then that kind of popped out of that. So that's one new thing that we're possibly looking at for the future. Um, they have to look at the legalities because um, that's the one thing we don't know about storing food. You know, what type of situation you have to have for that type of thing. That's the end of my PowerPoint. Um, are there any questions that are out there that people might be having about this? Um, yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dave. That was. Um... That was really a really cool pro program that you're doing there. Everything, all the different things you're doing. I mean, it's very um, interesting to hear all the all the work you did to figure out what needed to be done, and then everything that not just you guys, the library, but the whole community is doing to get together to um, handle this issue. Um, there seems to be a lot of uh, awareness in South Sioux City, I guess, about this that it's a problem, that something that needs to be addressed. 
And that's the one thing I found. Probably the thing that opened up my eyes more as a library director than anything else, how much a library director gets involved out in the community and is part of the community of that, you know, that aspect. If I check how many meetings I go to on a weekly basis or how many of that kind of stuff, I feel kind of bad because I'm not at the library. You know, doing what you traditionally think the library director should do, but that's, that's being part of the community. And so uh, when we go to some of these meetings and somebody will make a comment, like we had a police officer make a comment once about the library, and we were, I, I was just shocked because it's like, God, maybe we are doing something right, because he just <laughs> went on and on about this. So. About all the great things that you were that he'd seen you're doing at the library. <laughs> yeah, because we worked with uh, gang intervention. That's one of the other little options that we worked with. Um, besides the different ones that you saw there, we also worked with Dakota County Extension. We're working with STEAM Education mm -hmm. type program right now, and then environmental ed type things is just on the horizon. Um, we're looking that will probably be towards the end of this year and next year that we'll be doing that. Um, we have one advantage that the city really works cooperatively with us. Um, and so like for the community orchard or the community garden, the city will come in with a tractor mounted rototiller that they have and fill up the garden spaces for us for no cost. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, the city has put in um, fire hydrants to be able to hook up garden hoses at the community garden spaces. So, you know, there's a lot of those extra little things. And what, mm -hmm. if you know about South Sioux, if they can get grant money to do it, they'll do it. <laughs> so, a lot of these things, there's mm -hmm. not really an expense that comes out of our budget or that comes out of the city budget. Right. You did mention a couple of times that there was grants um, that f um, paid for some of these. Was and that's what I was wondering about too. Was it city applied for things, or did the library apply for grants? What were these grant? Where were these grants? Um, where did they come from? High V does uh, kind of a gardening food uh, oh, grant okay. each year, and so the places nice. for food. The very first year the library did. The second year the city did it for the community orchard. Uh, the city did that one, the Parks Department. The Voices for Food did a grant last year and this year with IB. And then there's other groups that are out there that are national organizations that you can put in a request for to get funding. Um, so, you know, relatively, I, I'm just surprised how much we've been able to do for literally nothing comes out of our pocket. You know, our big, big expense is the staff time for doing some of the programs and things. Mm. Yeah, here I just was looking at High V, and I actually just I just Googled High V grant and found a they have one step community produce garden grant and a bunch of other things that they do. Yeah, um, and they help with the community orchard. They did, and, and I'm trying to remember either a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. I can't remember off the top of my head. So yeah, Hy-Vee, it business. says it won't it won't will not exceed a thousand dollars per garden. Okay. Right. And still a good test. That's what you can do. Community. Work with them for doing something like this. Because mm -hmm. we're also looking at the chance this year, possibly at us to get it pulled off, is putting raised beds right here at the library. And mm -hmm. the raised beds would actually sit, we have some areas that are cement covered, you know, that when they built the library, they kind of thought this was going to be a picnic space or something like that. Nobody ever uses it. So we thought about putting raised beds right on top of the cement. Showing people that you don't need to have that green grass underneath your garden where you plow it up. You can build a garden up on top and then have the kids mm -hmm. that participate in some of our programs here. They're the ones responsible for kicking back care of the raised bed garden. Oh, yeah, lots of people. I know people do raised beds just all, and um, if the dirt in their own yard isn't. Uh, good enough for gardening, yep. they can haul in a little bit, and rather than digging a hole and doing all that work, it's much easier to build a little box, put it all in there, boom. Yeah, and we've talked about doing like about a four foot high raised bed, so mm -hmm. kids can stand right there and play in the dirt, literally, and create <laughs> the garden, and 
and it's all soil and other stuff mixed in, grass clippings and leaves and wood chips and whatever else you want to mix into the mixture. Right. But, uh, and what a lot of people then find out, well, I don't really need a yard. You know, I can grow something in containers. I can do this kind of stuff. And so we look at that as being a potential program too down there. Yeah, and um, container gardening is something too. Yeah. I know I've um, – Years ago, my sister, she was in an apartment with a uh, balcony, and she wanted to go, she grew in a pot, just a little oversized, maybe a couple feet wide, uh, tomato plants, just in a pot on the balcony. Don't even need yeah. an actual yard to put some of this stuff in, yeah. I actually do a program on container gardening, and one of the pictures I've got is a fellow, incredibly genius gardener for doing stuff, but lives in a, like a, Two-story apartment. I don't know what you call them. They're two-story. <laughs> but uh, he has a little patio down below, and then he has uh, like a bedroom upstairs with the balcony. He has stuff growing off the balcony up above. He has stuff growing all down, and it looks like a little jungle. <laughs> and it's all fruits and vegetables and flowers that are growing there. Mm -hmm. And so he, he will actually water up on top on the balcony, this is a metal balcony, and it'll overwater so it will in the rain down on the garden stuff down below too. Right. And so there's a picture of him sitting there reading the book in the midst of all this lush growth all around him. And there's sweet corn growing out of containers and that's what's interesting about the Peter garden right now. Literally any kind of vegetable you can imagine you can grow now in a container. So they've got dwarf varieties miniature variety. You can grow um, fruit trees in a container. Right. Great. Um, so does anybody else have any other questions? Um, if you guys have any, you in the audience have any questions, type them into your question section of your GoToWebinar interface. I can grab them for you. Um, or if you have a microphone, I can unmute you and you can ask your question that way. Uh, I'll just remind you while we're waiting, um, I've been grabbing some of the links that Dave was talking about and putting them into the commission's delicious account. Um, so I, I found some news articles about your uh, the um, the Voices for Food uh, group that you're with and the High V grant. So we'll have all of that available to everyone afterwards. And we've had that turning your program around. That was one that we did for you a while mm -hmm. ago. That one's yes. actually been used by I got called by Kansas and North Carolina. Oh wow! They actually showed it out there. One of their conferences one time. So. <laughs> Great. And um, Dave, if you, well, when we're done with this, if you want to, you can send me your slides and I can put them up along with the recording afterwards. Okay. Yep, just send them to me in an email sometime later today. It was an interesting challenge trying to stretch this out from that 10 minutes. Thing. <laughs> Are I you kidding? Is it, you had a, a plenty of things to talk about. <laughs> Uh, yes, originally this was something that Dave was going to just do 10 minutes on for um, an event for us, um, but I convinced him that it would be, even, you know, we can talk more about that, obviously. Not a problem at all. So it doesn't look like anybody has any urgent questions or typing in right now, and that's fine. Um, we probably covered everything you need to know about doing this in your own library. Um, the links are out there, information, um, contact info, and a lot of these websites about who you can talk to about doing something in your area. Um, I think this is great, like you said, Dave, doing something, thinking out and uh, thinking outside the box about what the libraries libraries should be involved in now. And especially you mentioned, I think, in the beginning, in your city, um, there is not a community center type place that could potentially in other areas be this kind of organization place that would handle this. So in the smaller towns. Um, Libraries stepping up, just talking to everyone else in the community, figure out what needs to be done. Yeah, because if you compare that to city, you know they have Boys and Girls Club, they have mm -hmm. uh, agency that does, you know, they have the main food pantry. In, I mean, they have all these little equivalent things that we're trying to do, kind of as a library here, mm -hmm. and working with area groups to try and be able to coordinate it. Um, because like the Voices for Food, we don't have a specific location. We be in different areas for our people. Right. Um, the Dakota County Connection meets in different locations each time because there's not a set place for them. 
Um, so, you know, it's a very fluid. And what's nice is this community is very aware of those social type things because so many of our social services got pulled out of our community because of funding issues. Mm. So where we're located, we didn't have enough population they figured. Mm. To work having a, a department of human services. Your own here. dedicated so, office, yeah. Yeah. So that's one of our kind of long range goals down the road. Hopefully, if we get this business center started, we'll get a DHS office that mm -hmm. they can come in on a weekly basis and come in once a week and help deal with people. Uh, that's where our uh, county health nurse has really come in helpful here at the library because. Uh, people can't get down to the Dakota City where it's located at because there's no buses that run down there. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of people that come in here and use the health nurse, and then she also helps fill out a lot of those forms that the library staff traditionally had to fill out forms for people. You know, and you're getting all that personal information. You're not a social worker. You're not trained to doing that. Right. right. So, Mm -hmm. That's helped us quite a bit. Well, it's great that your town, a lot of people in your city are so flexible to work together to do this. And hopefully, I was just thinking as you're mentioning that, you know, they didn't think you had enough population to need some of these specific offices. You're showing by having doing these programs and all the people that participated and all the food that you provide um, that it is something that is big enough that they need to, you know, have a, have a presence. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in your area. Yeah. Great. All right. I mm -hmm. Yep. I think we'll wrap it up for today then. Doesn't look like anybody had any desperate questions to ask you while I said we wait a little bit here. So um, I think we'll wrap it up this morning. Thank you so much for doing this, Dave. Um, like I said, it was very interesting. I'm very impressed. Cool about all the things you're doing. Also sad that it's necessary, but that people are in the situation that they need this, but that you guys are out there doing it is is great. Well, the one probably re biggest reward mm -hmm. is the city traditionally has been doing for years now a Christmas basket program where at Christmas time uh, volunteers deliver Christmas baskets throughout the city to people that are in need. Mm -hmm. And this year they did over 2,000 Christmas baskets wow. and delivered them literally in a two hour time period with enough volunteers. They pack them full of food. Everybody gets a turkey or a ham. Um, and then volunteers drive them out throughout Dakota County and go up to houses. And that's kind of the cool thing. You knock mm -hmm. on the door, someone answers, here's your Christmas basket. Mm -hmm. And you just see the tears and you see the things that go on. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you go to some of the homes and you're just like, boy, I thought I had it rough. But, <laughs> They've got it 10 times worse. So. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Great. All right. Um, thank you very much, Dave. I'm going to pull back control to my screen here now. Okay. Um, cool. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, everyone, for attending. That wraps it up for this week's show. We are recording, and it will be available, as I said earlier, on our website, our main Encompass Live site. We have here our upcoming shows, and right beneath that is a link to our archived Encompass Live sessions. And right over here is where um, today's show will be posted maybe later today, maybe tomorrow, depending on how long it takes to get everything processed and, and, put, and up there. So that's where you can find that and all of our previous shows. Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is the secret to successful internships. Um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we're starting another round of our internship grant program. And Joanne McManus and Mary Jo Ryan, who run that, will be here with us to talk about um, how to participate in that, what's going on with that, um, whether you are in, in this grant itself, it could be useful to you, or if you're just doing this kind of thing in your own library, in your own state, um, some of the tips and things they have going um, for this grant pro um, program be of use to you. Um, so definitely uh, sign up for that and any of other, other, our other upcoming shows that are listed here. As new things are finalized and confirmed, I add them to our schedule. Also, if you are a big Facebook user, please do go over and like us on Facebook. Um, we have a Facebook page as well. I post here reminders of our shows. Here's my login for right now reminder for today's show. When the recordings are available, I post them up here um, so you can get a notification of that. So if you are big on Facebook, do pop over there and um, like our page so you can keep 
be notified of what's going on with Encompass Live. Other than that, that wraps it up for today's show. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.